What makes a great story? Oh my God, what makes a great story? Wow, that's a good question. I have a friend who's like a real writer writer and he always gets on me because I don't, I don't care a lot about plot. Uh, and I think there's probably two camps, maybe. There's people who care about character and there are people who care about plot. And I don't know if, if, that's, if that's part of it. Um, I think like, I think it just has to be, there has to be a, a reality to it. I think that, that for me, rather than like, you know, it's funny because uh, I was just talking to my students about this. There has been this thing in recent years, and it's not new, but I would say in the last five to seven years where the value of a story is related directly to whether or not the audience can cannot anticipate what the ending is going to be. In other words, the twist has become so suddenly the gold standard of what a, a great story. In other words, if I didn't see it coming, that's what makes it a great story. You got me. You know, that's what makes it a great story. And I feel like that's kind of cheap, you know, in a way. So I feel like it has to be character-based, that the characters have to be real first. And I'll almost forgive a plot that is not so clever if the characters are, are strong and real. That's That's... To me, that's my standard, at least now. So, right. So, if the characters seem too much like they're acting, quote unquote, yeah. Even though it must, it's a great story, and you didn't see the ending coming. To you, that doesn't. That I doesn't think get I, I think characters that serve the plot are less interesting than character than than characters that motivate plot. Like there's there's a certain philosophy. I'm sure I'm, I'm certain because you guys have interviewed so many writers. But you know, I think whether it's easy for me or it's just something I happen to subscribe to, but I feel like if you can create a character first that, and create a character in a certain number of situations and not necessarily, and not necessarily outline the entire movie, although it depends on the movie, but if you have a full character that's real, that you've created, and then you put something in front of them, in a way they will begin to write the movie because you know how they're gonna react to whatever you put in front of them because they're now these dimensional characters as opposed to let's have this happen, let's have this happen, let's have this happen and we'll just make sure that they do these things that I've you know, preordained. And I think that's what creates a feeling of artifice or you've seen it all before or boring, I think. And, and so to me, if you create a real character, then whatever happens as a result of those characters interacting is bound to be more interesting than somebody, something that's just been constructed. Like I, I was attached to a, a big studio movie not too long ago, and the script was green lit, and everybody loved it. And I was reading this thing, and I was like, I don't understand this. Like, and this is not a complicated movie. This was like a movie with dinosaurs and fighting and all that. I'm reading this thing, and I'm like. Why is this guy do? Why is this guy doing this? And I went to the writer and I said, you know what? This doesn't really make much sense. You, you, you. In the in the in the first act, you talked about how this guy was scared of heights. There was a whole dialogue about he was scared of climbing the mountain. And then later, he's like on a tightrope fighting a pterodactyl. Like, why, <laughs> why, why, what's going on with that? And he goes, I just thought that tightrope thing was cool. And I was like, yeah, but it doesn't make any sense. You understand? It's like, you know, you set up this guy. So there's got to be. You you can't just put stuff in because it's cool. I mean, people do it all the time. But as a director of this thing, uh, I was looking at it like, well, how am I supposed to direct this with any kind of confidence or authority if I don't believe this thing? And so I think there's a lot of writing that's just like, well, let's be cool if this happens and let's have this happen. That'd be cool too. And you have this pile up of cool shit, but that doesn't have any resonance because it's not based in any kind of reality or at least any kind of consistency or something like that. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's that's something. It does. So the character's quote arc didn't didn't cross over to the tightrope scene like was yeah. there did the character go to a fear-based weekend right, or something right or, 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 or no? just to have him acknowledge the mm. fact that you know when he got to the tightrope scene that he was still scared but was overcome. You know what I mean? It's like right. but it's almost this um, uh, negligence, not even negligence, it's almost like apathy, like who cares whether it's consistent, who cares whether it makes sense, as long as it's cool. And um, I think the coolest movies that have the coolest shit still um, are, are weighted or, or, or rooted in some sort of reality that they, the writer has believed and has maintained, as opposed to just um, an assembly of things that, that, that just happen to be exciting but don't really 
either trace back to something or connect or make sense for the character. That's really what it is. Does it make sense for the character? Would he do that? You know. Um, so like the example I always give my students is that like if we're walking along the street and all of a sudden a mugger jumps out with a gun and grabs your bag and runs and that's all we have in terms of like it's the only idea we could come up with in terms of plot. The next scene is if we know who we are, we know what's going to happen. Like if you, if for me, like if the mugger pulls out a gun, I'll probably, you know, fall down on the ground and cry and weep and hope for it to be over. On the other hand, if I had created, like if you're, you're a former cop or you were in the war or, Navy SEAL, right? or whatever, you know, <laughs> or somebody who's like been, you know, mugged a couple of times and now carries like brass knuckles and mace, whatever the deal, whatever you've set up, what happens as a result of that mugger pulling the gun and grabbing thing and running, it's either becomes a chase or it becomes us going to a bar and crying together or whatever it is, but at least you know, or it's a fight or whatever it is, but you don't have to have the pressure of, okay, now I've got to come up with the next thing. Now I've got to come up with the next thing because if the character is built, then it will dictate to you in a way what, what will happen, which is actually less pressure on the writer because now you don't have the burden of having to make up every goddamn thing. The characters are in fact writing the movie to a certain extent. Yeah. They talk about having that dialogue test where someone's just reading a character and then people need to try to figure out who's speaking and if your character is authentic enough we, we should all know. You should be able to identify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, I, there are things like, for example, there were situations where when, when uh, my writing partner Jim and I were first coming up with one of our films, La Cucaracha, way back in the 90s, one of the first images that came to mind was this idea of a man in a wheelchair in almost this true grit sort of scenario where he was like rolling into this town like guns blazing in a wheelchair. That was the first idea in Mexico. We didn't even know how, how it got there, but that was the image. And I was like, holy shit, that's amazing. We got to make this move. We got to write this. We got to figure out. And the irony was by the time we had created really this character and this scenario of this writer who goes down to Mexico who's really not a tough guy at all and everything goes wrong, by the time we got to this finale, which was the seed of the whole thing, as much as we wanted this badass thing to happen, it didn't make any sense anymore. It was like too big. It was, it was out of character. It didn't make sense that this would happen. He wouldn't do this. And we kept trying to like force ourselves into writing this thing and it was like no it's it's not going to be that because that's not that's not true to the thing that we actually wrote so i mean it depends on your philosophy I, a studio is not going to give a shit about that a studio's going to say put the fucking wheelchair thing in because that's awesome <laughs> uh -huh. but a but a writer with any kind of conscience is going to be like either go no that doesn't work or they're going to have to really find a way to justify i always heard that um that that was Hitchcock's thing, that he would come up with a series of set pieces. Sorry. No, that's okay. I always heard that Hitchcock basically came up with a set, uh, sequence of really cool set pieces, like I want to chase across the faces of Mount Rushmore, but I don't know how it happens. And then he would lay it on the writer to somehow get, you know, I want a Mount Rushmore thing, I want a crop dusting thing, That'll, that'll be awesome. I want to stage those and shoot those things. I don't know how the hell it happens, and now it's your job, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Writer, to figure out how to make it make sense. Of course, he had the luxury of being able to do that. The writer still had to figure it out, though. The writer still... And when you watch North by Northwest, you, you look at it, and you're like, wow, that's a lot of, like, effort to kill this guy. Really? They're going to they're gonna bring him out to a cornfield, and they're going to try to kill him with a crop duster? Why doesn't somebody just pop out and shoot the guy? Isn't that, isn't that easier? Shouldn't there just be a sniper in the... Why is there a crop duster? Well, it's because Hitchcock came up with this awesome idea, and the, and the writer is just basically going, okay, well, if I maneuver this enough, maybe no one will <laughs> notice that it's insane. Um, so, I don't know. I guess, it, I guess it really does depend on, on the philosophy of the writer or the filmmaker. How do you feel about the quality of storytelling that you're seeing in the world today? I mean, uh, that's a good question. What do I, how do I feel about the quality of storytelling? That's a good question. I don't know. I'm not really attracted to a lot of new stuff. I think because I've seen it before. And that's just my personal thing. At this point, uh, I, I think it's just a, an age thing. And also, it's a, it's a result of being a film nerd because when you consume as much cinema as I have in my lifetime, you you have seen 
in most cases, the best iterations of a particular story or genre already. So when I see something new that just manages to be good execution or, or well-executed version of a story that I've already seen, it's not enough for me anymore. So I don't, you know, I find myself going back to the films that have, that really changed my life, um, that really did it best because I want to be nourished in that way. It's not enough for me to see something that's just a really good yarn that was well directed and well produced, even though that's a monumental feat. Any filmmaker will tell you, you know, that, that making a good movie is a miracle. But for me personally, I, I, I tend to look to the past for the inspiration because I feel like in most cases it, it was done best. And, and, and that doesn't mean that I'm, 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 I'm resistant to somebody showing me something that's truly brilliant because I would welcome that. If somebody showed me something that was just earth shatteringly brilliant that I better than anything else, then I would be like, Jesus Christ, thank you. You know, I want to see that stuff. And I'm sure it's out there. I'm sure it's out there. I just haven't seen anything lately. I know like The Handmaid's Tale it was a movie with Elizabeth right. McGovern. Was right. it in the 80s, I think? Or yeah. early 90s, maybe? Uh, yeah, the, what do you mean the original Handmaid's Tale? Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. and so now, now it's like got a whole new life to it. Right, exactly. You know? Yeah, yeah. And it's now they're spoofing it on Saturday Night Live. And, right. You know, right. But, but back then, I, I don't remember if I really heard a lot about it. No, no, it. it's funny. I actually, I think it, it was in the 80s. I was actually an intern at the production company where they were making that movie. Really? I remember Xeroxing and fucking up the Xeroxes. <laughs> I remember, I think it was, uh, I forget, who was the director of that, of the original Handmaid's Tale? I can't believe I'm blanking on this. German director. But anyway, there was, it was in New York City. I was like, you know, a PA in the office. How cool. And uh, they were having this special lunch meeting or something, and I was charged with getting the new draft together. And I was like, you know, printing this thing out and it was jammed in the print. I ran over to 21 or wherever they were having dinner and I remember giving it to the producer and it was like all the pages were out of order and everything. He's looking at me judgmentally. And I'm like, I'm <laughs> fucked. I'm never That's gonna great. work in this business again. Um, yeah, well, a good story, I mean, a good story that is, that, that a filmmaker or a writer finds a way in that, that changes it or makes it more contemporary or more, um, resonant or, or personal, whatever it is, I mean, I think that's, that's totally valid too. Um, but I just haven't seen much recently that's like blown me away. Right, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, a, a band that does, you know, you know, when the levee breaks or something, and right. it's like, okay, it sounded so great when Robert Plant sang it, but now you're doing it, and it sounds good, but it just doesn't have the same appeal. Right. But again, is it a generational thing? Because I know you and I were just talking off right. camera about video discs and just seeing older, like even 90s sure. films that it just had a different feel to it. Yeah, well, I think that's true. I, I mean, I talk to my students about this all the time. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing age and it's a horrible age. It's amazing in the sense that anything you want to see from the history of the world is available. Like, you know, like that. Like, gone are the days of hunting for a revival house that's going to be showing The Third Man or Seven Samurai or what have you or anything for that matter, or the last detail, or whatever it is. Uh, it's not like you have to like hunt for a video store, not that they exist anymore, that's gonna carry a special John Woo Hong Kong action <laughs> thing that when they can't find, like everything is available at any given moment. That said, there is so much material, there's so much available that I, I wouldn't know where to begin. And I think that that's a problem because unless there's somebody, a teacher or, or film geek parent or somebody saying, Spend your time watching this, 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 and this before you watch this other stuff because that's going to educate you. That's going to make you a better filmmaker. Then you're, you're bound to lose those, those great things. And I'm not even talking about like the obvious classics. I'm just talking about even minor films that are still better than a lot of junk that you see today. Um, you're never going to see them. They're, ne they're never going to see them because there's just too much to look at. And so... I'm sort of losing the thread of the question, but I think um, my, my, my feeling is, is that there's just almost too much to see now, and it, it'd be, be better if you, I don't know, if someone helped, it's almost like you, you need to graduate, you have to, like you, there's a prerequisite, like you have to watch all this stuff if you're gonna be a filmmaker, and then you can watch as much junk as you want. That's out now, you know, almost something like that. Right, well, a lot of stuff seems over-processed, you mm -hmm. know, like 
too 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 overproduced in yeah. some ways, and maybe just as a culture we've become used to that. So if it's not packaged that way, yeah, we don't want it. I think you're you right. I, I think we were talking about this earlier. I think that if social media is overproduced, in other words, if somebody's personal Instagram page with all its requisite filters and <laughs> glam, you know, with this glamour and 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 the tools of production in the hands of anybody. And it raises this level, this, 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 this standard of what is acceptable um, to a professional level in a certain way. But it also creates a certain artifice. It's, it, you know, one of my favorite quotes that John Cassavetti said about um, Hollywood films in general is that they're an advertisement for life. That's what he said, because Hollywood movies, in most cases, are an advertisement for life. And he was saying, whereas my films which are clearly comparatively very rough and perhaps even uh, mistakenly looked upon as almost uh, amateurish compared to that polish. And mistakenly because that was by design, by him, because he, he was a professional, but he made his films look a certain way because he was trying to get at something that was the opposite of that. He was trying to get at the messiness, the reality of life, whereas Hollywood almost by definition tries to minimize that in favor of this gloss or polish or uh, illusion, you know? And so, yeah, uh, I think that becomes the, the diet that you're consuming. Then if you see something that's grittier or messier or, and I'm not even talking about the look, I'm talking about the content, where the content is not just this clearly safe, defined thing. People may have a resistance to that. They may go, whoa, this is not, I don't want this. This is too much. This is not what I'm, you know, this is not the food I've, I've chosen to eat. But what does it do to your taste? You know, it, it limits your taste to only want this candy and not something that's more uh, sustenative or what's the right word, substantial in that way, you know, it's nourishing. Yeah. I was just watching part of the Stepford Wives. Which one? Oh, oh, the the, the original? first one. Yeah, right, the original. Right, yeah, yeah. And uh, just how uh, you know they're like the long driving sequence in the yeah. beginning with all the credits and the right. classic like yeah, yeah. was it seventies? Yeah, I think uh -huh. yeah, okay. Early 70s. Track you know at the time oh, yeah. that we would hear all the time, and now it sounds so wonderful. But at the time, every show and movie had it. That's right. But uh, you know just how it was so quiet of, in terms of there's there's just moments where it's it's not like something's happening every. Second. Right, right, He's right. Breathing. Yeah, and I think that's that's actually, and I've always said this, and anybody will tell you this, that the strength of a spike in a story or a or movie where something goes crazy, where there's a lot of kinetic activity or surprise or whatever, is directly related to the quiet that precedes it. In other words, something is super loud or big relative to what preceded it. So that's why in a horror movie, then you know, they learned this going all the way back to the 30s, but if you if you have a very quiet, almost nothing happening, and then a huge scare, that scare becomes magnified. Whereas if you have to maintain what is now, you know, the classic Hollywood mantra of just a thrill every second, then each, then that thrill every second becomes a plateau. You just become accustomed to it. It's not going to, it's not gonna hit you the same way if you allowed for that quiet to precede it. But that assumes that the audience, or it probably assumes, assumes that the producers are willing to allow that quiet to happen and not be go, oh shit, people are gonna be bored. We gotta do something exciting. And you can't be, have this length of quiet. Um, and that the audiences are willing to um, invest in that and be okay with that and say, this is not boring, this is interesting. And then be the beneficiary of the result of that if something huge follows it, because it'll be huger you know, because of it. I was watching a documentary on Mary Shelley. Yeah. And it was saying that, uh, you know, first off, I know she had to sort of publish the story anonymously because yeah. they didn't think a woman could write it, but also her age factored in. And I was wondering, do you think that age factors into creating meaningful work? Hmm. I don't think age, I don't think age is an issue if somebody has experienced something that is worth communicating. I mean, I think that it all, it's all based on how much you have inside of you at the time that you're creating the stuff. So there are plenty of young people who have had tremendously rich, dramatic, even traumatic experiences that are perfectly positioned to do something magical with that life experience. 
I think the problem comes when you don't have enough life experience, you don't have anything to say. You know, that's the problem. I, I can't remember which filmmaker it was who said when he graduated from film school, he said everybody was just scrambling to try to make their first feature. And he said, I'm going to take like, I'm going to take five years off and I'm going to like live some and live. I don't know, but I'm going to live my life because he even then knew that he didn't have anything to say that was worth saying yet. So I think that's probably a problem with a lot of filmmakers is that, you know, if they don't constantly inform their work with what's going on or if their lives don't, don't, aren't enriched by their, by certain experiences, they end up just, that's the classic going up your own ass thing where you just, you know, you're not really saying anything new, you're just repeating. So I think that's, that's what's most important is what is the, what is informing the work, not necessarily the age. And obviously Mary Shelley was perfectly in a, was in a position, had plenty to say on this subject and knocked it out. So it didn't, didn't really matter. I mean, Orrin Orson Welles is obviously the, the you know, the, the prime example of 20, you know, somebody in his middle twenties, you know, doing the ultimate commentary on a, on an old, on an old shattered man's life. You know, that, that's the, that's pretty, pretty amazing that someone have, would have that perspective. So I guess it depends on the individual's perspective. But I think a lot of people think that their life, and everybody's life is unique. Sure. And that, oh, well, I've had these tragedies, even though one is a different set of tragedy and the other, they're equally painful to the person experiencing it. But don't you think that people, everybody thinks they have something to say at 18, at 22? Oh, I think so. And some really do, and maybe some need to go out and... I think so. I think it depends on the person. I, I, I think that, um, I think everybody thinks that they're, I mean, look, everybody's, everybody's life at any given moment is, is valid and dramatic. The question is, does that translate into a, into a movie? You know, and what, you know, obviously Truffaut with 400 blows, you know, is a perfect, or even you look at Rob Reiner doing Stand By Me. I mean, if you nail it, then you can, you can paint a picture of the, of the drama and the complexity of being, you know, an adolescent. You know, you can, that can be infinitely dramatic if you, if you get it, if you get it right. Um, so it's not like a child's life is invalid. Or I was just talking about the Red Balloon the other day. I don't, you know, the Red yeah. Balloon is one of those movies where when I was in college, everyone was like, oh, you got to see the Red Balloon. I'm like, I don't want to see a movie about a little kid and this magical balloon. That's like, you know, who cares? I want to see, you know, real gritty. And finally, I sat down and watched the Red Balloon when I was like, you know, 21. I'm like, oh, I'm great. Because it, it perfectly captured that feeling of being, you know, seven years old and alone and everybody hates you and particularly if you're bullied and it just nailed so i it depends on the it depends on the story and the person who's telling it everybody's life is valid it's just a question does that does that translate into a 90 minute movie that anybody's going to watch you know i know we were having a conversation before we got going about the competition online and how hard it is to you know get people to see your work right where do you stand on creating things that audiences want to see and maybe willing to pay for versus creating work that's meaningful to you. Right. And maybe it's going to just be a little niche audience. Right. Well, I don't think I've ever been any good at um, thinking in terms of let me craft something that's going to be a, a, a big audience favorite. Because I think that it's hard enough for the filmmaker or for me to get interested in a particular story anyway. In other words, I never felt that I was, even though I can execute any story and I've done television, I've done things that were scripted, I can, I can make that movie and I can make it hopefully work. To, to, to set out to make a film, that story has to be meaningful personally, otherwise I won't have the strength to, to go through the obstacles and all the no's and it's not going to, there has to be something driving that for me personally. So, and I never thought I was necess necessarily skilled as an architect of that kind of audience, crowd-pleasing, super commercial movie. I just hope that because I do love um, commercial cinema, there's plenty of commercial movies that I love, that somehow by that love will find its way into whatever story I'm, t I'm, I'm doing and it will contain those elements, but hopefully will be... Uh, more personal, it, it won't be as uh, machined. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I'd probably be more 
I'd probably be a wealthy man if I was, you know, skilled in that, you know, and that, that. But I think the best people who, who do make commercial movies, and you can just rattle them, you know, going all the way back to Spielberg or Michael Bay, those people that do make those movies, um, they are, that's, that's how they think. In other words, it's not like, I don't think they're sitting around saying, let's, you know, make a commercial movie. That may be on their mind, but their tastes are exactly that commercial thing. So it just happens that ah, right. the audience, of course, is going to connect because they are that audience, and that's they're the perfect they're the perfect people to make that stuff. Otherwise, everybody would be able to do that if it was simply a matter of like reading the the, the instructions on how to make. Then everybody would just go, yeah, I want to be rich. Let's just do that. And and it's, it's not for lack of trying. Everybody tries. A lot of people try. But for me, I have to find. I have to find a story that is valuable in some way to me and then I can I'm happy to to, to add on all the um, quote unquote commercial components or exploitative components or any of those things that that you find in a commercial movie but at least the foundation is is personal all right I think you have a movie like and um, maybe people disagree with me but into the wild right so it's about Christopher McCandless's of story course. And I hadn't really heard of the book before the movie came out. Right. But I didn't realize there was like this whole cult following for this book. Mm -hmm. But that's one that it seems like you wouldn't expect the audience to resonate, even though I think it's a fantastic film. Right. And I loved it. But but it's a story, it's a very special story that's that right. you wouldn't it's not about, you know, an everyday thing. But but somehow it was able to resonate with millions of people. Right. That's well I think surprising. I think you're right, because I think it's um Probably because the specific, the, the nature of the story about somebody based putting themselves out into the, into the wilderness to that extreme, it's not the specific act that everybody can relate to. I think it's the internal thing that the person is going through that people connect with. And that's what I'm talking about. I mean, there's something universal in those kinds of feelings. And I think that's why, for example, they always talk, you know, everybody involved with Taxi Driver said, this isn't, you know, we're making this for us, but probably no one's going to get it. And then it turned out to be this huge hit because there were a billion uh, very alienated, lonely, angry individuals out there that went, oh my God, that's, you know, I, I identify mm -hmm. with that. So I, I think we'd be a lot richer filmically if, if the business allowed for more of those movies to be made because, you know, a producer is not going to, you know, is, not, is, is going to be looking for something that is obviously... Um, something that people can relate to, but but people are much more complicated than 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 the way they're depicted in Hollywood movies. And so every once in a while, when something presents a reflection of that, it, it, if it gets out there, I think uh, it will be successful because people are like thank you, thank you for showing you know showing me that I am represented, um, as opposed to it just being you know a cartoon or again an advertisement for life. So even something like Legally Blonde, which is a it's a cute story and there's a great sure. message in it and I enjoyed the film, uh -huh. but it makes light of someone that's sort of ostracized. Right. And in real life, someone probably wouldn't be, well, I'm just gonna, you know, get all dolled up and go in there and show them. It's gonna be, you know, a lot of pain behind the scenes. Right. But it, it's definitely showing something that many people have been through. Right. But right. in a light way where it feels safe. Well that's that I mean, and that's bound to be the more commercial. I mean, if you can somehow illustrate those really painful, awkward things in a way that manages to be entertaining or safe, which I think is a really good word, um, because most people go to the movies um, as a you know they go to the movies they they take it like a tonic. They're not they're not going to be uh, unless you're going to a torture porn. You know, you're not going to be ripped apart. You're going to be soothed. So camouflaging or or sugarcoating, or I don't know how you put it, um, real things in a Hollywood way, I think is a real, that's a real art and a real trick. And if that can happen, you know, like for example, like for me, like I resisted Groundhog Day. Like when Groundhog Day came out, I was like, this is just a one note thing. I think most people thought that. Oh, this guy wakes up every day. Ah, I'm gonna... And then when you actually watch the movie and, you know, Harold Ramis does this, and Bill Murray do this brilliant do job of getting at a lot of real deep, things in this very silly gimmicky movie and that was obviously their intent you know that that dealing with somebody who is bitter and given up and doesn't give a shit about people anymore and has disconnected and just a user and then through this 
this twist of fate now has to like go through the stages of processing that till he becomes like a human being. You know, if you made a straightforward movie about that without the gimmick, I don't think it would be that as popular necessarily. People wouldn't go to see it. But with the twist and the comedy, um, let me say that again. But with the twist and the comedy and the Bill Murray aspect, the whole thing, it becomes this much more pleasurable uh, pill to swallow. Uh, and a surprise in a way. And that's why like, I love that movie because it's like, wow, I thought this was this superficial shitty thing and it turns out to be actually a quite complex, interesting movie. And I love that. I mean, I, and there are times where I want my message or my uh, identification in a nice candy package. We don't always want it, you know, rough. Do you have any creative regrets? Like a film idea not followed? Well, I think my biggest regret would be not making the movie I'm trying to make right now. I mean, Search and Rescue is a movie that's like been percolating for at least seven or eight years, um, if not longer. It's a movie that I, I feel like I should have made a long time ago, but I was sort of, not sort of, I was scared for a lot of reasons. I didn't think I, didn't think I could handle another disappointment if it didn't happen. Uh, because obviously anybody who's been, you know, like John, I remember I heard John Borman say something once that was really interesting and I totally got it. He said, he, he said in a very bitter moment, he said, this business is all about the movies you didn't get to make. And I was like, really? You made like a lot of really cool, you made Deliverance and Excalibur and all the Hope and Glory, you're, you're being bitter. But for every <laughs> filmmaker, there are all those pictures that didn't happen, which is just the nature of the thing. But in the case of Search and Rescue, that's a movie that I always knew was going to be independent. I, I knew that the movie couldn't really be produced traditionally anyway, which is perfect because I'm so fed up with the way Hollywood works anyway. And, and, and I realized that this was something that I had to do truly independently. But it took me a while to muster up the courage to, to do it. Um, and so I think my biggest regret would be if I didn't follow through with this movie, which now we're in the, you know, in the early, early stages of it. But that's, that's, that's my, I don't think it's a fear. It's just, I, it's put, you know, my, I'm pushing myself from behind to make this thing happen. So I don't have those regrets. Why now though? I think it's, you know, I think it goes back to, to what you were talking about, about where I am timing wise in my life. I mean, I feel like this is the right time for me to make this kind of movie for me. Um, I just reached a stage, and it's been several years now, where I felt like the movies I, were, I was making for hire uh, just were not, it just wasn't, it just didn't sit right with me. It just, I felt like I was spinning wheels or, or worse, wasting my time. I just felt like, yeah, I can make a shitty sci-fi movie, but that's what it is. And it does, you know, I've said this, I think we talked about this before, I think all filmmakers are are heroin addicts in a way, not literally, although some are, uh, in the sense that you're a junkie for just the, just the process of making a film. So it's hard enough to get anything made. So even if somebody says, we're going to offer you three bucks to make a movie for Sci-Fi Channel, do you want to do it? My first instinct was always like, yes, because it, it was that needle in the arm, like we can make a movie. But the, the box that those movies gets gets made in only allows for a certain type of movie to result no matter what you do. I always have this delusion that I'm going to bring, I'll be able to bring something more to than, than what is usually expected of, you know, a low, a low budget exploitation movie. And in the end, there may be little hits here and there of individuality and maybe a pinch more intelligence, but in the end, it is what it is. So then you spent an enormous amount of time and energy on something that is essentially inconsequential unless unless I was happy being that. But I always felt like I was wrestling with um, identity issues. Like, what did I want to be? Did I want to be a professional Hollywood director and did I want that? Or did I also want to be somebody who made movies that mattered to me personally? And I, when, I, when I really did the math and I looked at the different films that I've had the good fortune to be able to make over the years, you know, good or bad, I looked at them and I went, you know, I was most satisfied when I was making 
I was most myself when I was making these really small movies where I didn't really have to deal with the bullshit of Hollywood or people telling me to recut it or cut this storyline or or put this music in or whatever. Nobody monkeyed with it. And even though I wasn't getting paid anything sometimes, that was where I felt like I was at home uh, creatively. So, you know, I, I got to a point where I felt like this is where this is where I need to be if I'm going to be honest with myself. Or I can keep pulling myself in these different directions and allowing myself to say, yeah, if I make this other thing, you know, it's it's, it's okay, it's good. You know, but there was a part of me that was telling me, you know, you, you, you kind of got to go back to your early ideas, your early films, and that's where you were happiest, right? I did have a really um, good spike with... Uh, some guy who kills people, that was like an accident, you know, where this like present dropped out of the sky. The timing was just, you know, it was just like one of those things where if you stay at the slot machine long enough, something <laughs> good will happen. Well, something managed to drop mm -hmm. that I happened to connect with. And that was like, I was just super lucky to get that job. But I didn't create that. You know what I mean? I didn't, I didn't self-create that. That was just a, that was just really perfect timing. And I, you can't, I can't allow myself to just hope that something else is going to drop from the sky. I kind of got to put it on the line and, and, and make the thing myself, you know. We talked about um, the addiction part, and, and yeah. I, I've probably mentioned this a gazillion times in, in Film Courage interviews, but um, it's, it's the subject of like your levels are blown out. So, so uh, the filmmaker uh, Sebastian Younger, he made Restrepo with mm -hmm. Tim Hetherington, right. mm -hmm. and he talked about um, men that go to battle. That yeah. sometimes they keep going back because going to the family barbecue, like the level of of the adrenaline rush that you're right. used to, is no longer there. Like Absolutely. your levels are blown out. So I would imagine that's similar for someone who's been on stage doing stand up or music and filmmaking as well. I agree. I think that it's like. You know, you've gotten this taste of a certain energy when you make a film. Even if you've only made one film, even if you've just made a short. You know, and I tell this to my students, if you make a student film and you get this rush that you've never felt before, and you really want that rush again, and that's what motivates you, then you know you're a real filmmaker. And if you can get that rush anywhere else, then please do it because it's so much easier. Sure. So I think that when you've made a few films and you know what that high is, then you crave that high and it's very difficult to just be satisfied with not making a film. I mean, I think that's really what it boils down to. It's like most filmmakers are not satisfied when they're not making a film. So you spend a lot of time in between hustling to try to find a way to get to that that high again. And just like a soldier who, you know, mysteriously to, a, to an objectively it sounds crazy. Like, why would you want to go back? But even if you listen to the opening of Apocalypse Now, the narration is that, you know, is that stuff. When I was, you know, when I was here, I wanted to be there. When I was home, all I wanted to be was back in the jungle, you know, and it's that sort of like, you're, it's a heavy attraction or addiction. So you put together the crowdfunding campaign uh, video, right, for yeah. Search and Rescue. Mm -hmm. um, it's excellent, by the way. Thank we you. Have, um, part of the movie in the beginning, right? And yeah, we actually mm -hmm. shot um, a standalone, I guess, teaser for the movie. It's funny because the, you know, the, 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 the teaser in the, in the campaign is not actually a scene from the movie. When I really tried to, some people try to like cobble together moments from the actual movie. Um, the main character, Kevin Corgan, is definitely the main character. But I was trying to find something that would represent sort of the tone of the movie, not only visually, but also sort of the black comic component. So it's a violent movie and it has a certain degree of black comedy in it, not unlike Some Guy Who Kills People. And I wanted to kind of do something that would just say that very quickly. So I realized I could write something separately that would represent it. So that's the whole trophy hunt, you know, beating the shit out of the trophy hunter came from that. Although now that I think about it, I, I'm now thinking of actually incorporating this idea somewhere in the story so that maybe it could even work as like a post-credit sequence. Like somewhere in the movie, almost outside of the plot, there's this trophy hunter thing so that at the end of the picture, he beats the shit out of the trophy hunter almost as like a bonus, you know? Um, but yeah, that's where, that, that's where that came from. 
so then you have another part of the video where then you introduce the campaign right. and then you show uh, behind the scenes footage of you on set with right. at least one or two different productions. That's right, that's right. And I enjoyed watching both. It's almost like they're two separate things in one, which was helpful. Yeah. Um, but when you watch that footage of yourself directing, is that someone you know right there? I mean, can you believe that like, wow, that's me? Because you almost have to become a different person, I'm sure, when you're yeah. directing. How do you feel seeing that, that footage? And this is going to, I'm sorry, I'm taking a drink here. Oh, that's okay. Can you jump cut these? or? Sure, sure, yeah. Well. When I look at myself in behind the scenes footage, I do recognize myself in it, but as you, as you mentioned, it's, it's me in set mode. Like, for example, I had some students uh, that uh, assisted in the production of the, uh, of the teaser, and they only know me from class. They know me from my lectures and how I... And when I'm in class, I wear you know a suit jacket, and I'm you know, and um, I'm a bit of a germaphobe, so oh, okay. I'm like you know constantly you know like <laughs> you know doing this kind of stuff very neurotically, and I you know, and they they observed when when we were shooting, they're like, wow, you're you're totally different because now I'm in a t-shirt, I'm rolling around on the floor trying to show Kevin Corgan how to get hit and all this stuff, and I'm not conscious. It's a different it's a different head. It's a totally different head. You're just. You're in shooting mode. You're in, and what I tell my students is that, you know, to be a good director, you have to really disappear into whatever you're making. You have to be so in the moment. It's not like you're just executing IKEA instructions, which are the script. You know, that's the mistake. It's like, well, if I just follow the script and I build this shelf, that'll be. It's not that <laughs> at all. It's like this. It's this. Uh, this thing that the director has to do, which is sort of wed with the material, like, or it just has to become real, absolutely real. So you can't have any, you can't be self-conscious at all about how you look, or you're just in the in the in the making of the of the piece, so in the reality of the piece. So I think what I notice when I watch footage of myself is how in that head I am, like just doing it, which I love. You know, again, it's it's what all, all filmmakers crave is to get to that place where you can just like play and there is a real correlation I, I also say this in class it's like you know if you can remember when you're a little kid and you're playing with dolls or cars or are and maybe we've said this before but it's like you're never like self-conscious about that you're just like in it you know you're inside both of the you know and that's the way it, I, I like to be when I'm making a, a film you're just inside this thing that's actually happening as opposed to now we do this, and now we do that. You know, it's not a cold process. It's a very li alive, you know, messy thing. Right, and anything could happen. Anything could happen, mm -hmm. right, yeah. So now you're, you're looking to make this film. Has it all been shot, or no? You just no, 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 no. We just shot the teaser. Okay. You know, we, we, we shot the teaser. I was able to get, you know, Kevin Corrigan to come out from New York to do the teaser, and Lucy Davis, who's also in the movie. Um, originally, when I wrote the teaser, she was actually going to appear in the scene with the final, so she was kind of sort of pop out of the corner and, and, and do this final sort of, you know, jab at the, at the trophy hunter. But she's been shooting the Chilling Adventures of Sabrina in Vancouver for like six months and she can't get away. So I contrived this whole idea of this FaceTime thing. So she shot, so we, I directed her over the phone and she actually shot that, that piece up in Vancouver and then, you know, I shot a plate and that's how we put her into the picture but yeah we just shot this as really um, a sample to say this is the kind of movie we're making this is not just an abstraction this is these are the actors this is the look this is the tone and um, and now we're just going to you know re hopefully raise the money so we can make the whole thing why not make a documentary I'm just going to play the devil's advocate That's a good here. Question, so, yeah. if if you and I, and I know the word message is not like, yeah. but if for those of us who feel strongly about animals, and I am one of those mm -hmm. people, and and I know trophy hunting has gotten a lot of light, dark light on it, yeah. rightfully so, um, without going too much into it. Yeah. Um, but why not make a documentary? That's a good question. I mean, I think that if I was a documentary filmmaker, I'd make a documentary on animal compassion or how animals are systematically um, brutalized in factory farming and so forth. I, I, I would make that documentary. But I think those documentaries, thankfully, uh, exist or and more of them are being made. And up till now, that has been the way to reach people about animal rights. I think a really good documentary that illustrates 
life on a factory farm or animal testing, any of those things, or fur farms, or anything where animals are routinely uh, abused, a documentary that shows you what's going on uh, is a real eye-opener and absolutely ne necessary. But I'm a narrative filmmaker, and in many ways, I'm so ridiculously sensitive to to what goes on with animals in those situations that I can't even watch. I can't even watch those images. I mean, I know what they are. I saw, I saw that material, um, which is in many ways what made me become a vegetarian and ultimately a vegan. I saw what was going on, but I can't watch that again, and I can't watch it certainly as an entertainment. So for me, making a narrative, in this case a crime thriller, that has a lot of animal rights themes baked into it was the best way for me to communicate my feelings on the subject as opposed to a documentary because I am a filmmaker, a narrative filmmaker. I love genre. I love crime thrillers and thrillers. I love atmosphere. And I want to make the movie that I would want to see that would get this point across without driving me from the theater crying. Although I do think that stuff is necessary. Um, so we talked earlier about like how do you, how do you put this? Not not that legally blonde is the comparison, <laughs> but 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 uh -huh. you brought it up, which yeah. is that how do you get this message across in a way that's? I wouldn't say it's safe, but it's definitely more watchable than you know going into an abattoir, you know, with a video camera. So, I think that's the best way for me to to get my point across is in this in this format. You know, it's interesting that you, even though you, you've dedicated your life and your lifestyle to, to compassion for animals, yeah. not being able to watch certain things, and, and I'm the same way. I saw something interesting out in the public space, and I won't even say where it is because I don't want these people to get in trouble. Yeah. I want them to just keep doing it. Yeah. But they were holding these screens. Oh, the video monitors. Yes, and they yeah. were showing. No, they're amazing. Usually, okay, so okay, so yeah, we yeah, know yeah. we're talking about the same thing. Oh, people. no, they, yeah. And, I, I, and people, I could tell, were... were Scared and I was scared to see it, but I was like fascinated by what they were doing. No, that's that that movement is incredible Basically, you know, it's 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 a real hardcore mm -hmm. Way, but again a necessary way of saying okay look, you know, this is your meat You know meet your meat as they used to as, as the expression used to go. It's like check it out This is what happens. Yeah, and you know these people gather in huge public places and they have these screens and oftentimes they're, you know, wearing yep, anonymous masks. anonymous mm -hmm. masks. Right. And you see people for the first time seeing what the truth of this stuff is and they they are rightfully, you know, justifiably destroyed and hopefully cannot unsee that. You know, I mean the the expression if you know, if if all if slaughterhouses were made of glass, we'd all be vegetarian is a true statement. There's a reason why that world is is socked away outside of the public eye and why meat and eggs and all that stuff remains just a product safely packaged without any of the pain that 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 is the origin of that stuff because if you saw it you'd be like shit I'm not gonna eat that so those people are really you know that's the real work where you're like okay you know this is the truth you want to you know and I think they're changing a lot of people's minds you know bit by bit well, not only that, but if you're, isn't it a, a terrorist offense to, or, or considered an act of terrorism to film within one of those places? I'm not, you know, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. I just know that the people who actually liberate animals, I mean, people like that are part of Animal Liberation Front, or an, or an unoffensive animal, organizations that basically take direct action and go into a fur farm uh, or a factory farm and, um, either damage the property, but more importantly, rescue the animals that are either going to be experimented on or killed, they are definitely branded as terrorists, even though they never hurt people. Right. It's strictly, it's a business thing. It's amazing to see how corporate, how that kind of money is able to, I mean, it's the history of the world, influence, you know, policy so that these people, you know, do serious jail time. And, you know, they haven't hurt anybody. If anything, they've, they've wrecked some They've destruction of public property or private property, and they've saved animals, but yet they'll do hard time for that. You know, that's crazy. So 10 years ago, I believe you visited the Cat House on Kings? Yeah, the Cat House on the Kings, yeah. On the Kings, sorry. Yeah, and uh, yeah. so how did, this, how did this wonderful sanctuary change your life? Oh, it was huge. It was like, um, you know, we talked about this. We had a feral cat 
we, we've always had feral cats come to our house because we have lots of cats. And a feral cat, a wild cat, will, will just sense that cat people live there. And a feral cat obviously cannot be pet or touched uh, or anything. They're, they're wild animals. But we've done this over the years and we fed feral cats. So, uh, you know, I guess it's a little bit over 10 years ago, we were moving from our apartment. And just as we were about to move, a feral cat showed up. And it was like, feed me. And I, we were like, yes, of course we'll feed you. But we're moving. And it, we were faced suddenly with this prospect of like, what are we going to do? This, this, this animal is like dependent upon us now, but we're moving. It got to the point where I was like literally driving across town every day <laughs> to leave food. It's this empty house. The cat was standing there. It was the saddest thing. He's, he's like, where's my food? I'm like, I'm driving across town. We, I can't keep this up. I can't expect the new tenants to, to take care of him or whatever. So I started looking into rescues and looking into um, that whole world. And it's a, you know, again, I became educated. I was like, wow, there's just, there's just tons of kill shelters. If you bring an animal to a regular shelter, likely they will be killed. Certainly a feral who can never be adopted, rarely. Um, what do you do with a feral cat? And so after a lot of research, I found this one place, which I'd never heard of, the Cat House on the Kings, which was this one woman's massive property up near Fresno that she had turned in this ranch-style multi-acre property into this sanctuary and adoption center where she had, you know, almost a thousand animals that were totally cared for. It wasn't, an, it wasn't a hoarder. It was like an operation. Sure. Mm -hmm. And she was like, yeah, you know, we actually have a feral, you know, section and if you can catch him, you know, you can bring him here. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow. And where all of your, everybody else was like, we're full up and they'll kill him and all. This was the one place. And when I, when I went up there, it was like one woman and a couple of, you know, maybe one other person and all of these animals. And I was like, this was like the definition to me of like a saint. Like this was like this woman who had dedicated her whole life to, to these animals, literally, and was like making it work. She, she definitely needed help. But, she, and I, I said to myself, my God, well, what, what can I do in exchange for this? You know, you save this cat's life and these thousands of other dogs and cats. So I decided to make this YouTube video. I said, I'll come back and I'll do a portrait of you and the place, a couple minutes and, you know, we'll put it on YouTube. And this is when YouTube was sort of new, you know, and, and it just, we just, as luck would have it, there were enough cat people out there that it started to go viral and people really saw that this was a, this beautiful soul that was doing something so unique and she started to get donations and it started to get more well known. And now, you know, 10, 13 years later, it's, a, it's, a, it's considered, you know, it's a very well-known institution, you know, around the world. People come from all over the world to visit this place and support, support it. So it's a big part of Search and Rescue's story um, the ending of the whole movie actually happens at the cat house. It actually takes place at the cat house. And I'm trying to talk Linnea Latanzio, the, the proprietor, into actually playing herself oh, nice. in the movie if she'll agree to do it because <laughs> she's such a character. But yeah, the whole movie actually resolves at the cat house. Have you thought about what would have happened if you had moved one week earlier and never met that Yeah, no, I hadn't really thought of that. It's been such a... You know, my wife has said, you know, it's the most important film you ever made was that film for the Cat House because, you know, talking about direct action, that film, because it went viral, because I made it, because it exists and it reached people, that, that institution, that sanctuary received much needed donations that saved a lot more animals. And so in terms of doing something that's valuable, truly valuable, that little film, you know, when I think about it, you know, is, is, you know, definitely up there as being an important movie of mine just because it helped, it ultimately helped a lot of animals. Do you know how many views that video has? Well, I, I think, you know, I think now it's, you know, it's well over a million views, but it, but it, um, yeah, you know, like, but conversely, you know, like I did this, you know, fun monster thing for YouTube years ago, <laughs> Fear Force 5. That has 50 million views now. Oh, wow. Okay. But the million and a half or whatever, the cat house is way more valuable because that, that just means something in, re in real world terms. You know, there were a lot of animals that got saved because people gave because they saw the video. So, yeah, I'm, I, don't, I don't know what would have happened. Certainly, Search and Rescue wouldn't have 
evolved the way it did because my there's a there's a cat component and there's a feral component and a rescue component uh, to the story that is that is a, a thread in this crime story um, that is the direct result of my experience with with the cat house on the kings and why I feel it's appropriate to end the movie there even though there's gangsters and assassins and pornographers and all this other stuff in the movie it ultimately ends at the cat house you know which is like the sweetest place on earth it's interesting too that you say just a million views I mean that is almost impossible to right. get these days so going back to writing or creating something that the audience you think the audience wants you were just doing this because you wanted to get people to know about that's it or, and yeah a million is still I mean that's I know it's very huge no no it's it's, 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 today. it's absolutely huge I think it has to do with um, what's behind the thing well I it doesn't really matter because it's so random I like to think that if the thing that you're making if the thing that you're making has real meaning or has real meaning beyond like I just want it to be successful like there are plenty of people who make shit that just want to be rich and famous and then there are other people who make things that there's another reason behind it there's something real behind it that hopefully like the truth will out that somehow that will smell like the real thing and people will and talking from from a from a web based thing that maybe people will be attracted to that thing because it's real as opposed to a pose but that's not necessarily true because there's plenty of stupid insignificant <laughs> shit that has trillions of hits <laughs> so I mean that's, that's you know that's that's my you know that's me w wanting some sort of justice in the universe or some sort of rationale um, but I do think in the case of the Cat House on the Kings I think people did respond to like the sincerity of that place you know it's like the it's like Linus talking about the sincerity of the pumpkin patch you know <laughs> there's something sincere so uh, no bullshit just like this woman is like this is why she's doing it there's no ulterior motive there's nothing and when you see that it's hard to say like it's hard not to go Jesus let's let's help this person you know so yeah very meaningful to, to, to just accidentally be be brought into that to the cat house because it, it changed you know the way I think about a lot of things it's interesting for people who have rescued animals yeah these different moments where these animals have either come to you or that animal led you to something else mm -hmm. I think everybody can probably attest to that oh definitely have, you know having had my own rescues come through my door and different things that happened you know like one of them I would gotten in a, a minor car accident but I had to get my car fixed and then there's a cat right so I would have never had that cat which I ended up having for 15 years right had it not been for me and it was a drunk driver and right. I you know had to go and pay for it myself but going to that you know mechanic and then like oh whose kitten is that in the road you know and then right. getting it so different things like that for those of us who have absolutely I think you're right and I think there's a it's different from like when you plan a family or something you know like you you plan to have you if you plan to have a baby and then you try to have the baby and you have the baby and you raise the baby that's a different thing for animal people where in most cases these incredibly important members of your family kind of happen in this happenstance kind of way you know like you said like it could just accidentally you were in this place at the at this time and now this animals come into your life and now that animal is like inseparable from your life and, and 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 as meaningful as any human child would be you know and that's another thing that's hard to explain you know people get very defensive yes. about it. how can an animal be like well they are I mean an animal people will tell you uh, and when they die it's like you know it's as it's as traumatic it's as powerful as when a human being dies um, so but I do think it's interesting that that these key figures in your life sometimes just come out of nowhere right. you know um, not planned right yeah I've stopped arguing with people I, I had I was at the vet with a cat and a, a man stopped and I thought he was gonna remark on how adorable the cat was but instead he just wanted to argue and say why do you treat this animal like it's so great and I was like they, yeah okay how much time do I give this person right you don't know <laughs> yeah you can't you can't you, it's impossible to explain to somebody who who doesn't know you know but those who know know right Right, and yeah. so that's a nice, you know, and, and the same thing about arguing vegetarianism or whatever. That's right. I've just, I just don't. I find people want to argue it with me, and that's fine, yeah. but I, I, I don't. I'm not there trying to convert yeah. anyone. Yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, food. It's so interesting. People take food very personally. Food is such a personal 
thing. It's not just this, it's so wrapped up in people's histories and their families and it's almost like religion. And so you can't, it's not that you can't challenge them, but it's going to lead, people get very, you know, like protective about that kind of stuff. And I think that, you know, all you can hopefully do is, you know, not not necessarily judge, but if you just, you know, if you judge somebody, that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is, is sort of talking people into being open to like opening themselves to the information, at least have the information. Um, because if you have the information and you are the kind of person that feels like they can make a choice and, and ease suffering by not eating certain meats or certain foods, then they will do it. And I think there's this huge explosion in the last, this is the last couple of years of veganism and vegetarianism that, that you haven't seen before, I mean, all over the world. I mean, it's just, just in, and just in terms of the foods that are available now, this looks like something like the Impossible Burger, which is everywhere, right. you know? Mm -hmm. You can buy, you know, um, Beyond Burger at Vons, you know? So where you weren't able to find, um, you know, vegan food, um, it's everywhere now, you know? So it's hopeful. Right. It's interesting that you say that about how food, it, it, there's a lot of issues around. I know I'm not a gluten-free person, but yeah. I know there are certain people I've met that, man, if they find out someone is a gluten-free person, they just, they want to back it up with all the scientific <laughs> research, how they should, it's it's all, you know, nonsense. Right. right. Okay. That's the person's choice. Let them have it. Whether, you know, But see, it's celiac, like religion. You know. It's like religion. Again, it's like, you're like, it's not enough for you to believe what you believe. You must destroy the other person's belief. That's why it has that. It's that's why food does have that weird sort of quality, which makes it a very delicate subject. Sure. Um, but you know, that's why it, it it takes all kinds. You know, I think the direct action people who show screens of, of slaughterhouses. I mean, that's that's the most in your face kind of stuff that you can do in terms of raising awareness. You know, what I'm trying to do is sort of couch it in an entertainment, because I think that's a way. That's another way of reaching people. You know, maybe it's a, a subversively. A way of reaching people, you know, um, but you know, however the information comes across is is good. What are your first steps in the screenwriting process? I think the first steps when I when I begin to write is a lot of thinking about thinking about it. Like I don't, I'm not really good at just sitting down and starting to bang it out. And I don't really, oftentimes I don't write an outline. It's not like I have to make an outline first and then write the script. So for me, usually it's a couple of ideas that just won't go away. And so if those ideas won't go away, then that means that there's something, hopefully there's something there. And I just let it percolate. And it has a sort of magnetic, if it's a good idea, and these are rare, because it's not like I have like, I've never been one of those guys that just like, you know, I was able to spin a good yarn and have a million stories I want to tell. But in the case of Search and Rescue, it was just a couple of ideas started to sort of bind together. And I think some of them were ideas that I had for other movies that didn't go anywhere. Like, in other words, they were, that's, in, it's now that I think about it, there were, there were several different ideas and characters that had been, I had been developing for other movies that didn't sustain themselves. They were good, but they didn't, so for some reason they didn't belong in whatever movie I was thinking I was trying to make. And so it all started to kind of combine into this one film. But you know what, I, you know, that's specific to this particular movie and every writing, every writing process is different. You know, if somebody comes to me and says, I need you to write Mega Shark versus Giant Octopus in two weeks, that's a different that's a different process. That's when you sit down and, you know, figure out, you know, okay, act one, this, that should happen, then this should, you know, that's when I do that. So, so you know, work for hire, that has to be of a, of a you know, I think that's easier. Uh, a simpler genre is easier to do than, than, than this. But I really did have to think about it, and I really did have to draw from a lot of things that had been dormant, ideas that had been dormant that sort of all sort of coalesced to, to form this thing. That's how it started. Then I did, then of course I had to sit down and write every day. Like everybody else, you have to write it. You know, you can think about it all day long, but you have to write it. Did you have dedicated times to write it? I did. I just, I finally, you know, I kept talking about it and my wife was finally like, you, should, you need to write this thing. You just need to do it. You know, and with, certainly without Valerie's, you know, insisting that I just, you know, get down to it, I probably wouldn't have done it. But I did. I just basically realized that if I got up at, you know, five in the morning every day, 
that I would be in this kind of, uh, you know, a lot of writers talk about this, this kind of like haze where you're not really judging, you're not in a, in a critical mind, you're just sort of in a semi-dream state. But if I got up at five and wrote for like till nine or something like that, you know, if I wrote for three or four hours in the morning, that I could bang out, you know, without me judging myself, I would just knock out, you know, four pages or three or four or five if it was a good day. And I just did that, you know, over, you know, however long it was, a month. I just, just every day, just knocked out a little bit. So at least, you know, after, if you do the math, I mean, five pages a day at times 20 days, is what, 100 pages. So in, with inside of a month, you can get a draft done. And then you go back and you're like, oh, this is shit and this doesn't work. And you actually are able to tackle it uh, critically. But at least the hard part of just getting it out was accomplished if I was diligent and got up and just did it. And that's hard, you know, it's like going to the gym or whatever. That's like, that, that takes, you know, anybody will tell you that's, and some days you don't have anything. Sometimes you just sit there, you know, and you're just like, you know, I got one line. But I think as all writers, will, real writers will tell you, that's like what's necessary. The writer writes, you can't expect to just not do it and then have great stuff pour out. You have to go to the gym, you know, so that's how it, that's how it happened. You said something earlier about you have a friend who's a real writer, writer, and mm -hmm. I was just wondering how how is that different? How how what is a real writer, writer? I think a real writer, writer is someone who just writes all the time. Like that's what they do. It's not even about like making physically making the movie. It's about writing. It's like they write one script and then they start working on the next script, or they write one novel and they're already outlining the next novel, and they're just. What I consider dyed in the wool writers that, would, that are not hyphenate, you know, writer directors or whatever, they're just writers. And I have real respect for that because, you know, it's like, it's very myopic. It's like this is their skill, you know, and it's a very difficult thing to be a good writer. So I have a lot of respect for that. You know, I, I, I'm a writer, I don't think I'm a writer naturally, I'm a writer out of necessity. In other words, I became a writer because I couldn't expect screenplays to fall out of the sky for me to direct. So I became a writer so I could have some control over the, the films I wanted to make. But I feel like it was a longer process to become a, a, a pretty good writer, whereas being a director felt more natural to me. I just had a more natural instinct for it, whereas writing felt like work, you know. And writing still feels like work to a certain extent. It feels like you really, whereas when I'm making a film, even though it's hard, it never feels like it never feels like work. It just feels like, you know, natural for some reason. So I feel like the writers that, that are real writers are the ones that, this, that they, they speak that language. They hear that music. That's their, that's their way, primary way of expressing themselves. So whether you were writing Search and Rescue or just in general, do you rely on a certain structure or book to help you start the screenplay, finish it? You mean a book for the source material or a book for inspiration? Inspiration, a writing book. No, you know, but I, there is one book that I, you know, I probably mentioned this before. There is the, that book by Stephen King on writing, which was key when I started to sit down and do Search and Rescue. I don't know why, because Valerie didn't point me to that book. But I think I, either somebody introduced it to me or I just came across it. It was right at that point where I was, you know, am I going to do this? Am I really going to commit? Am I going to do this? And then I read that book by Stephen King, which is this really thin book. Have you, have you read it? Yeah, it's great. And it's he great, talks right? about his life, too. It's not just right. a how-to. It's not just one of these, mm -hmm. like, you know, this is how you write a book or a screenplay. It was, the, it was very conversational, like his stuff is. It was very uh, unpretentious. And it somehow demystified it and made it easier to start. So that book, I think, was really key because I felt like I, I just needed to kind of I don't know, it just seemed less complicated than like reading one of those classic screenwriting, you know, like books, you know, where's the inciting incident and all that. It wasn't any of that stuff. It was just like, this is, you know, this is how I do it and it works for me and maybe it'll work for you. And I was like, okay, you know, so that was key. I mean, I don't, and I actually recommend that book when I, yeah, you know, excellent. when people say what book, that's the book I recommend for writers. I thought it was good too, um, and I forgot exactly how he says it. It's been a few years since I've read it, but mm -hmm. when he actually became a writer, writer in terms of he was hired, and then it was difficult to finish things right. without 
substances or whatever. You know, I mean, yeah. it was it was very interesting how you wouldn't think that that would be a problem. Right, you wouldn't, right? all of us are waiting to get to a point where we don't have to worry about a day job. And then he talks about not having a day job and having to be disciplined and things like that. Right. That's a problem I think a lot of us don't think about. No, no, I think, and also there's a pressure now all of a sudden, it's like you're not, you know, now you are this thing, you are this professional thing, so you're expected to deliver, you know? And um, yeah, I just think he made it easy to for the prospective writer to, to just, you know, to, to realize that, yeah, this stuff is probably in you and you just have to be you know, you just have to be serious about it and get down to business, you know, and and it's the it's the unofficialness of it or, or the, uh, the the not mathematical kind of step by step process that I think made the book good. And it spoke to me anyway, because, again, I didn't I didn't think that way anyway. I didn't I didn't naturally feel like I could needed to out. I could outline every single scene of the of the of the movie before I wrote it. And in a way, it kind of started to kill the any of the joy because writing is so hard. To me, the discovery of the piece as you write it is something that is one of the most enjoyable parts of writing to me because otherwise you're just executing something that's already been formed. And to a certain, and to a certain degree, I mean, that's what you're doing when you're making a film, but there's such a translation from the word to the to the image with actors and everything. It's just that's such a huge translation that it that doesn't feel boring. Although I heard like again like Hitch, Hitchcock used to say, by the time I made the movie, it was so designed that I was like it was bored to death because I knew it so well. I didn't even want to show up. It was done in my head. But for for writing, I felt that if it was so laid out, that I would just be like a slave to this outline. Like now I got to write this scene. Now I got to write this, as opposed to something that you know, would sort of reveal itself. So that to me is like the coolest part of writing is that when the movie, when the, when the story starts to reveal itself to you, um, it becomes a, a living thing. Right. Have you ever followed a strict routine? You, you seem like you maybe vacillate. Yeah, I, it, it depends on the situation. Like, you know, with Search and Rescue, I knew that if I didn't get up every day and write, I wouldn't do it. Like it would never get done. I almost did it just to get, so I could just get it over with. You know what I mean? Like, if you just get up and do it, that, that's the math I did. If I can write three pages a day, it's finite. That means if I can only, if I only have the burden of writing three pages a day, that after, you know, you know, 40 days or whatever, it'll be done. At least there'll be something done. So just like, it was almost like a diet or something, like just do, just do it. Nobody wants to do it, but you just, I can do it, I can do it for a month. I can actually do it for a month. Now, that's why, again, going back to the real writer, the real writer doesn't stays on that diet their whole life. I mean, they just keep doing it. But I also think that the real writer is addicted in the same way a filmmaker is. In other words, it can't just be a chore. As, as hard as a writer will say it's hard, it can't be a chore. It has to be an addiction. Otherwise, you will not. Just like going to the gym for a lot of people is an addiction. There's something in the adrenaline or something, the, you know, you just get jacked up and you now you need to do this thing. So... Um, I don't, I didn't continue that. Once I finished writing that script, then it was, it was like, okay, now I got to think about like how I'm going to make it. That's why I don't say I'm a real, I'm a, I'm a classic writer because if that was the case, I would just put that away and start writing the next thing. But to me, it's just the step, necessary step. So I could now set about making the movie, you know, so that's where I am. You know, I went through the writing process so I could make the movie. And you have a campaign on Indiegogo. Yeah, we have an Indiegogo campaign. It's it's uh, it's it's continuing, you know, until the end of October. Okay. And um, yeah, everything is on there. You know, we that was another thing. It was also like, you know, what's what does it take to make an Indiegogo campaign? Well, it takes at least this, 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 and this. It takes a lot of. Um, it, I mean, it doesn't. It, it it can be different for everybody, but for the people. That, that were working with me, they were like, you know, we really got to spend a month or two, at least two months of just producing content that, that sets up the campaign. In other words, in a, building an awareness. And how are you going to build that awareness? Are you just going to comment that I'm making a movie? Or do you, in our case, create a lot of videos, a lot of um, sort of mini teases and, and aspects of uh, of the content of the story and also my biography as a filmmaker and the films I've made and all these things it was just a it was a production of two months before we even launched the campaign and then it was all the videos and 
and stuff that had to be created for the campaign itself. And even then, you know, you can do all that, but you had, you know, there's no guarantee um, how much you're going to get. But I felt like at least I had to put my best foot forward and do as best a job as I could producing that stuff. And so that's what we did. Do you have a, a target date for? Um... I want to shoot in January. I want to. I want. I want to shoot the film in January, and um, I think that's doable. And you know, like I said, the actors are on board. Um, Kevin Corrigan and Lucy Davis and Barry Boswick are all on board, and Alan Havy just joined the cast, and um, that cast will continue to grow. And as soon as we're like actually green lit, fully green lit, we're making it on this day. I know we're actually going to get bigger names to commit because there are a lot of animal loving celebrities in this town and um, and I'm sure they'll want to get involved in the picture if it's actually happening and they know they only have to come in for a day or two but uh, January is when I hope to do it you know here in LA yeah partly in LA the movie is set in LA but again you know like all independent filmmakers we'll just go where the where the dollar stretches farthest uh, we <laughs> actually shot Palmdale. yeah, yeah <laughs> we, well we actually shot the teaser in Oakland um, and that's where um, a lot of technicians and people I know, and I had some infrastructure there. And so we may actually shoot a chunk of it in Oakland, in the Bay Area, and another chunk of it here. But you know, it's a small budget, so you know, you want to like stretch the money. Sure. Yeah. And so the crowdfunding campaign, most of it goes to uh, production, or will it, some of it go to post, or? Well, I mean, it's 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 all towards production and post. Mm, I, I mean, okay. just just in, just the means of making the movie, and um, you know, I have to think about like you know, if we get enough to get it in the can, then that's what we'll do. You know, we'll put we'll put it in the can, and then we'll use that material to if we have to to raise the additional money. But I feel like you know, I think the most important thing about the process is that for anybody is just putting it into play, you know, like putting it, because there's a, every reason, there's a million reasons to not do it. Like, and most of it was just fear of it not happening or maybe it won't happen or whatever. And I feel like the second I committed to the idea of making the thing, that that itself, and that's this is not a new concept, but that in and of itself, that mindset attracted people to the, to the project and it started to get its own momentum going. And this, you know, you build it, bit by bit, you know, you build it person by person, dollar by dollar, and you just, you just keep going. So I'm very grateful just that I was able to put it into play. Yeah, there's a dog and right so, there. And yeah, so the dog you. agrees, yeah. see? <laughs> <laughs> so there's this uh, saying in the entrepreneurial world, and that is, um, don't die today. Mm -hmm. And that means try to keep the lights on for one more day right. doing this. So why do you think um, so many filmmakers don't make another film? Hmm. How do they get their first film made and, and then go on to their second and then their third and then their fourth? A lot of them, it seems like, don't. They don't yeah. go past the first. And I can understand why. They're tapped out financially, right. uh, exhausted. They didn't see it, had the kind of distribution that they wanted, obviously. Yeah. But you could, you could ask the same, why do people keep starting companies over and over again sure. and then go on to another one if it doesn't work That's out? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think it's different for everybody. I think that there are people that only have one movie in them, uh, you know, or that, that in the making of the movie, they realize that that was enough, you know, that that was enough. I don't need to make any more movies or want to make any more movies. But I think most people who are, you know, genuine filmmakers, if they make a film, regardless of what happens, whether it did well or never with never got distribution regardless of what happens you're you're constantly searching for a route to make the next movie whatever it is and so why they don't make a second movie may just be like you said it could be that they don't have the financial means to make it independently that perhaps they just maybe they've they've gone up for jobs but didn't get them i mean i've been up for millions of jobs that i didn't get um I don't know. I have a lot of empathy for filmmakers who don't get the next movie made because I'm I've been one of them. You know, I just know what that's like. It's a very painful thing to really want to work and make something and not have the the means or maybe even the psychological, emotional foundation to carry forward 
because there's a lot of like, you know, there's a lot of damage that gets done if it doesn't all work out, you know, and it often, most of the time, it doesn't. So there has to be something inside of you that, that somehow pushes you over all that damage to make the next thing. And I think that those that, of us that are able to do that are lucky. Um, but I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure. I just know that there are a lot of people who want to make movies that don't, that don't get a chance. Do you think they feel like angry that no one appreciated their work or is it just why bother? I think it's part of it. Um, I think if you put yourself in, if you put your heart and soul in something and nobody gives a shit, you're going to be, you know, the, the, the tendency to be bitter or disappointed or even broken is very likely. Um, it's funny, I remember hearing something about Marlon Brando who certainly, you know, had a rich and varied career and had no reason to complain, but they said there was a dividing line in his work. It was everything before One-Eyed Jacks, which he directed, his only, the only movie ever directed, and after One-Eyed Jacks. They said his personality after One-Eyed Jacks was much more, I don't really give a shit. Because he talked about how One-Eyed Jacks for him was like he put everything into that movie. He wanted that movie, which is the one movie he directed, and he probably wanted to direct more. He wanted that to make a difference. And people at the time were like, eh, One-Eyed Jacks, whatever. And so he was like, well, fuck this, then fuck it, I don't want to try it, fuck it, I'm not going to do this again. And he only gave this much instead of this much. Whether that's true or not, I think it's understandable. You can get, um, yeah, you can get despondent and you can get, it's like, you know, not wanting to, if you had been in a bad relationship and you, you, your heart's been broken, you're not going to be like, yeah, I'm going to fall in love again. <laughs> you're kind of like, yeah, maybe I'll, you know, you like, so there's a lot of, I'm going to wait for that. But I think that if you've been hurt, you're going to stop. You know, I know that, again, like Search and Rescue has taken many years for me to get to this point. Even though I've been super lucky to be able to work on a lot of different projects over the years, um, I hesitated putting this into play because I knew I had to do it myself, that I had to do it in an unorthodox manner, that it wasn't just going to be something that was all going to be set up. And I, if I knew I had to do everything. And that in and of itself is kind of like, once you start to pile up, all the stuff that you have to do, that, that in and of itself could stop you, you know, from taking that first step. So, yeah, I think that, that any, filmmaking like any art is populated by a lot of sensitive people. Because to do anything good, you have to have a certain degree of sensitivity. But that also make, makes you vulnerable to the, to what happens in the real world when things don't go your way. And maybe those people feel it a little bit more strongly and don't bounce back. As, as readily, maybe. You talked about dating and relationships. It reminds me of going on a date, like, yeah, I'll go, all right, I'll have coffee with this person, right. and you're just like, whatever. And then the person that you, and you're like, I can't, I can't even, That's right. I, I, I won't be able to speak, you That's know? Right. So, and, and those are the projects you want to work on, but you're afraid because, you know. What if it doesn't work out? Right. What, what if they break, what if, what if, what if the movie, it's like, almost like, what if the movie breaks up with me? You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. That's really what it is. It's like, I'm going to put my everything into this, and what if the movie dumps me, you know, which, you know, is funny. I never thought about it in those terms, but, you know, I mean, all you have to do is look at, you know, Terry Gilliam, and he's, he's said some really dumb things lately, which is like, Jesus, Terry, you're, you're supposed to be the freak. Why are you saying these stupid things? But, you know, obviously Lost in La Mancha is the, is the easiest way of, of, of representing that idea of going after something with everything you've got and then just to be sort of smited when everything goes wrong and the movie doesn't happen. So that experience is something that all filmmakers who've been doing it for years know that they've gotten this close or they may be in that just as in that case we're actually shooting and it fell apart so the movie can break up with you and that's a that can be devastating and that can be reason enough not to like start it not to get into another movie relationship sure or you can make your hearts of darkness and you can film it. Right. <laughs> you can just film it. Exactly. At least you get something. Yeah. And, and then you have two yeah, things that, that that's but right. that's a rare instance. That's that, true. <laughs> that's true. And I think he was, you know, it's clearly when you watch Hearts of Darkness, all he wanted was for that to, for him to fall off a pier and break his leg so he didn't have to finish the movie. So in that case, you know, he wanted out because he thought he was fucking it up so badly. And it just turned out that, of course, he wasn't. But, right. um, yeah, I think there, when you see a documentary about, about filmmakers going through that, that doubt and those fears, those are the healthiest documentaries. There's not a lot of them, 
but those are the ones that I think are the most beneficial to filmmakers and, and students because you understand that it's not just, oh, these are professionals that now they're there and they couldn't possibly have self-doubt and they couldn't possibly be racked with anxiety. It's like, no, it doesn't matter where you are in your career, you've, you're always, if it matters, feeling those feelings. And sometimes those feelings can be overpowering. You know, you have to be able to harness that and use it, that energy in some other way to get it done. But yeah, we all feel that those pressures and those, those anxieties, no matter where you are, whatever stage you're at. It's kind of like with Jim Carrey with the Netflix and forgive me, I'm drawing a blank on the yeah, name. Yeah, right. He was willing to show right. various things and a lot of people I think aren't willing to go there and I understand why. Yeah. And not everybody's at the level that Jim Carrey is. I think once you get to a certain level, then you can show all that. Right. You probably can't. That's true. Some, you know. Or, but people are afraid, people are afraid to expose that for fear of losing what you have, that if people see that vulnerability or that humanness, um, that somehow it will contribute to the, all the people taking that away, what you've, what you've striven for for so many years. But um, yeah, I think those are the healthiest documentaries for any filmmaker to see. Have you seen people who have, quote, supposedly made it, and we won't mention any names, sure. but that feel like they haven't made it, and that really making it, you never really assume that you've made it, that it's really one job to the next, some dry spells, some yeah. failures, a success, that making it is, re there's not really like, oh, this is, oh yeah, that's textbook making it right here. Right, right, right. That's a great question. Um, I don't know about, uh, I mean, I don't know about other people, but I know it in myself. I definitely know it in myself. I think that I am still thinking about like making it. I don't know about other people because I, I, I haven't really spoken. To, I mean, I have friends of mine who are, you know, classically big successful filmmakers, but I've never heard them talk about that they don't think they've made it. Maybe they have. I mean, I, I think when you're ambitious and you're shooting for something, um, maybe you never really see what you have attained, you know? And I think that, you know, for someone like myself, I, I know that there have been plenty of times, even recently, where I've been like, you know, jealous of somebody else's success or feeling like I got screwed and didn't get to make enough movies or didn't get the kind of budgets I felt I deserved or things like that. And it, it really takes somebody outside, like my wife going, you know what, you know, like when you, you know, you're, you're being, you know, you're whining about, you know, your poor me, but think about how many people would like, you know, cut off their arms to have done what you did. And, and sometimes it takes that kind of, that kind of bucket of cold water to go, yeah, yeah, you know, you're right. You know, I'm the luckiest guy on earth. But I think that the ambitious person is constantly looking to the next thing anyway. So if you're satisfied with what you've done, maybe you're not going to even do the next thing. You can just kind of go, well, I did it, you know? But the thing that drives, I think, creative people is this need to keep doing it. So in a way you keep kind of can almost like canceling out, you're forgetting what you did because it's not enough anyway. And I think about that sometimes. It's interesting. I think about that sometimes. It's like you, we spend all this time gearing up and thinking about it and then finally making the thing. And then that's going to be over. And then shortly after that, you're kind of like, okay, now I got to, I'm not happy. I got to do it. I got to do another thing. Um, I remember seeing in that great documentary, it came from Kuchar about George and Mike Kuchar. And George Kuchar, the great experimental independent filmmaker, is making some crazy project. And he's, they're, they're filming him putting the last touches on the editing. He makes the last cut. And as soon as he does the last cut, he goes, now I'm depressed. I got to, I got to make another movie. <laughs> you know, and it's almost that immediate. It's almost like it's that back to the drug addict thing. It's like you need that thing. So I think that contributes to a lack of perspective, which I know I've had, where I'm just so concentrated on what I need to do next to make, to fulfill whatever it is that I've forgotten that I've done some things that I should be happy with and be like, yeah, you know, you, you, you managed to accomplish that. That's good, you know? So I think that's, maybe that's more typical than, than not, I don't know. So maybe in some ways that's a good quality to have to kind of like, almost like forget about your success a day after it happens. Yeah. Because then it's gonna keep you going to the next. Because if you're so. too happy about it, then that's it. You don't yeah, need anything else. Yeah, I think it's gonna be a nice balance. I think that if in the time where you're not getting, when, when things are falling apart, like even if you've only made one movie or short, 
and you're struggling to make the next thing and you feel like it's never going to happen, you should still be able to hopefully call upon what you have done. Even if it's just writing, having written the screenplay, you can say, you know what? I accomplished that. That was not easy. That Not everybody can do that. That's something to be like to feel good about while I worry about that I'm not making the next thing. Like if you can, if you can take that that information and use that to support yourself and like take care of yourself, um, I think that's a healthy thing to remember, um, as opposed to just being in a constant state of want or or a constant state of I don't have and I must be like a junkie again who's just waiting to get get well. You know, it's like you, in a way, you almost need to remember what you have accomplished and use that as a as a buoy or something to, to, to lift yourself up when you, when you do have those dry spells which are frequent. You know, most of us never get to make a movie every year or every two years or every, even every three years. You know, it, it, it takes a lot of time and you have to have something to sustain yourself other than misery that you're just not making a movie. So, I don't know, it's a good question. It make, makes me think about it, you know. I gotta stop whining sometimes. <laughs>